Good morning, everybody. Uh, as part of our usual, usual housekeeping, uh, this is a CME accredited event. There are no commercial sponsors of this Grand Rounds. Disclosures were reviewed and no conflicts of interest uh, were found. Um, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Mark Sigmund to uh, Yale Urology. Uh, Mark uh, preceded me as a fellow at Baylor and uh, you know, has the distinct honor of, uh, when we go to our, when we go to the AUA, there's a point where you realize, like most of the people are younger than you at the meeting, but it's nice to see that Mark preceded me by a couple of years, so there's always someone who precedes me at these dinners, so thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark Mark's the uh, a professor of urology and surgery and the chief of the division of urology at Brown University. Um, he graduated from uh, University of Connecticut. He actually uh, went to Hartford High School, and uh, he did his residency at University of uh, Virginia and did a fellowship uh, with Larry Lipschultz in, uh, at Baylor in um, male reproduction, et cetera. Mark has been a major uh, contributor uh, to the field of male reproduction over the last uh, 20, 25 years. He's been a, a mentor to me, and he's been really one of the leaders in the field of uh, male reproduction. He's well published, and uh, you know, when Mark gets up, and speaks, I always see him as the voice of reason. You know, there are people who, who may be liberal, there may be people who are conservative, but Mark is always the, the voice of reason. He can kind of take a situation and logically uh, break it down into what makes sense and what doesn't. So uh, Mark, uh, thanks for joining us today. And he's gonna lecture, he's gonna give us a talk on the evaluation and management of the azospermic male, of which he is, uh, I believe one of the members that you're the chairman of the guidelines committee for that. Am I correct? Or vice chair. Thank you very much. Put this on, I guess. We have these at the medical school so the medical students can sleep in and then watch another time. Thank you for getting up this early. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for a wonderful meal last night. One of these I push. How do I use this? Go forward. Okay. So I'd like to talk this morning about a topic that uh, with Dr. Honig here, I suspect you don't need much information on this, but at least back home, it's a very confusing topic, and that is azospermia. And people often get very confused and use what we call a shotgun approach and start ordering every test that they were taught in urology. And hopefully by the end of this, you have a little more refined approach. Um, so we'll stay within what Stan called reason, and I won't make any comments, um, but we'll start with a, a typical case. Um, we have a male, a younger wife. We're not going to talk about paternal age effects today. Let's say they have primary infertility for two years. Wife has not been pregnant before. Um, the male has not been involved in any other pregnancies. Uh, but he did see his uh, local, local doctor who ordered a, a semen analysis, and he was told he was shooting blanks. So the question is, what are we going to do from here? Um, I don't have any disclosures. I have yet found how to make money from this talk. So you're faced with of all these tests. These are a variety of the tests that we have in, in, in andrology. What are we going to order? So let's start with some definitions. What is azospermia? And I often find that that's, it's a little confusing. And it means this very specifically. There's seminal plasma, so the man ejaculates liquid, but under the microscope, there's no sperm. This is not a dry ejaculate or an ejaculation, which would be uh, lack of emission or retrograde ejaculation. That's a different problem we're not talking about. And azospermia may be with normal volume or low volume. When we talk about azospermia, we usually want to break it down into simple categories. The first category is obstructive. 
What does that mean? It means that sperm production within the testicle is normal. But somewhere along the road, there's a blockage. Whether it's the vas deferens, epididymis, ejaculatory ducts, the sperm can't get out. That's in contrast to the second category, which is non-obstructive vasosperm. It means there is a problem in the testicle with sperm production. The evaluation should be the same that you do for any kind of medical problem. You're going to do your history, your physical. Everybody's going to get a couple semen analyses. And at that point, you should be able to have a pretty good idea of what the problem is. But then you may need additional lab tests to come up with your final etiology. History, physical, FSH. Those are going to be the key in about 90% of your patients to decide which category of azospermia it is. We use a very detailed medical history. I encourage you to use a pre-printed form the patient fills out. And it's really important to go over that with a patient because it is not uncommon that they'll forget little details that maybe they had a vasectomy accidentally or otherwise. So you want to make sure you go over everything with the patient. You want to do some, uh, get some information on the family history, and particularly the female's reproductive history is very important. You have to have an understanding of that. On your exam, we'll focus just on a few things. Testis volume is probably the most important thing on the physical exam. Are they small or the normal size? If they're, if they're um, small, you start thinking of lack of sperm production. Are they on the higher side of normal? They are. I think it's probably normal production. This doesn't always hold true, but most often it does. If they're really, really soft, you think that maybe there's a problem with sperm production. Epididymis, another very important and often neglected area, uh, particularly the residents tend to uh, miss this. A, an obstructed patient, typically the epididymis feels bigger, larger, full. Um, the exception being the patients with congenital bilateral lapses of the vas deferens because they may be missing two thirds of the epididymis. The head of the epididymis, the caput may feel full and that's a, a, a finesse point you may get when you see these patients. But it's in contrast to the unobstructed epididymis which is very much similar to a normal one which is small and empty. And what I often tell our residents is practice on your post vasectomy patients and your pre vasectomy patients. And you can even practice on your uh, post radical prostatectomy patients because they had a rather large vasectomy, but the epididymis on those folks becomes larger. And it's a good way for them to learn what it feels like. Absence of the VAS, you don't need any tests, you just need your fingers. And it's a diagnosis by physical exam. There's no role to do a scrotal exploration, and there's no role to do a scrotal ultrasound. It's not going to help. So you've done your history and you've done your physical. Now we have to do some laboratory testing. And as I mentioned, everybody, and this is the only absolute thing here, is everybody's going to get semen analyses. Usually you want two of them. The laboratory should centrifuge it because you can look at the pellet. And if you see sperm, it's going to be a sperm production problem. It's not likely going to be an obstruction problem. The other comment I'll make is people often get a post ejaculate urine for azospermic patients. And it, it confuses me because for that to be the case, the sperm have to go into the bladder, but the seminal plasma has to come out the end of the meatus. I don't know of a mechanism where that can happen. So for normal volume azospermia, there's no role for post ejaculate urine. It doesn't help. Now, I just want to go over a little anatomy. And this becomes very important when you're deciding what type of obstruction you may have. And this is all review for you. The seminal vesicles make the largest component of the seminal plasma. And the fluid that it makes is alkaline, meaning the pH is above 7. Prostate makes acidic fluid, and it's a smaller volume of fluid. The important point is that the seminal vesicles empty through the ejaculatory ducts, which is where the vas deferens join. So both seminal vesicles and vas go through the ejaculatory ducts. If you don't have ejaculatory ducts or they're obstructed, you'll have a low volume specimen that's acidic because the prostatic fluid does not go through the ejaculatory ducts. It goes directly into the prostatic urethra. So for the ejective duct obstruction or absence, you get prostatic fluid, low volume acidic specimen. That's all you need to make your diagnosis. So let's go over it. Again, low volume. If you have somebody with low volume azospermia, it's not likely retrograde ejaculation, as I just mentioned. You need to consider ejaculatory duct obstruction, congenital absence of the vas, testicular failure can do that with very low testosterone levels because they don't make a lot of fluid. 
and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, meaning you have a pituitary problem, so again, you have low testosterone. Similarly, normal volume azospermia, it's not likely going to be the distal ejaculatory duct kind of problem with CBAVD or ejaculatory duct obstruction because you should have low volume there. But you start thinking about you have a more proximal vasal or epididymal obstruction or lack of sperm production. What about pH? Very important. Low pH, we just talked about it, means absence of seminovesical contribution. You start thinking ejaculatory duct obstruction or congenital absence of the vas because that condition is associated with hypoplastic seminovesicles or absent seminovesicles. Fructose, forget about it. I was taught you need to get fructose. I haven't ordered fructose in 25 years. You don't need it. Now, Antisperm antibodies, I'll just mention this, it's not that commonly done, but normally males do not make antibodies against their sperm. Obstructed males often do, about two thirds of them do. So if you have a patient that is obstructed and you have a way of testing them for antisperm antibodies, if they have antisperm antibodies, it means that they've been exposed to sperm, so they're probably obstructed as opposed to never having made sperm. So you can do what's called an indirect test, which is a test on the blood. If your lab does that, you can order an antisperm antibody test such as an indirect immune beat assay. Uh, obstructed patients will be positive. If they're negative, you start thinking non-obstructive azospermia. Mark Goldstein's a big fan of, of doing this. Now, let's talk a little bit about ejaculatory duct obstruction and congenital absence of the vas again. These patients make sperm normally, so they'll have normal-sized testes. And typically, you'll notice most of the time it's on the upper end of the normal range, closer to 30 to 34 cc testes. Seminal volume will be low, pH will be acidic. Okay, let's move farther down testing. I mentioned hormone tests, FSH specifically. What are the uh, AUA uh, guideline uh, indications for hormone testing? Sperm density less than 10, and that includes azospermia. Also, if we have a patient with sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, we may get it as well. But for the fertility reasons, we're looking at sperm density primarily. All the other seminal components have no role in the indication for hormone testing. The initial test should be an FSH and a testosterone. You may want to get a bioavailable or a free if it's not an analog assay. But FSH and T are the two tests that you should start out with. If the, if the testosterone is low, not the FSH, by the way, that doesn't have to be low. But if the, F, if the T is low, you want to repeat that. And that also is uh, uh, guidelines. And when you repeat it, you'll get a T, uh, uh, you may get another FSH, but you'll get a LH and a prolactin to make sure there's not a problem with your pituitary. So <clears throat> let's talk about FSH. If you look at your uh, typical hospital laboratory, the FSH goes from about 1.5 to 18. There are no men who make sperm normally that have FSHs of 18, that doesn't exist. And the problem is, is when those normal ranges were designed, they took men who looked normal, meaning you look normal. You didn't examine them, you didn't ask them if they had children, you didn't do semen analyses. In fact, if you look at men who make sperm normally, they don't get much above about seven, seven and a half in terms of FSH. So when you see FSHs going somewhere above five to seven is my general rule, I start leaning towards an a uh, lack of production. If it's less than that, we start thinking of obstruction. Unless, of course, the FSH is lower than normal, which you'll think of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And not always, but usually this will hold true. To put it another way, if we take a look at the level of uh, FSH on the line here, if you go to the far left and it's really low, low, lack of production, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, to the far right, hypergonadotropic, meaning you have elevated FSH and you may have elevated LH. So that is a problem with testicular failure, which means non-obstructive azospermia. And right in the middle, if it's normal, you're thinking obstruction. So at both ends of it, there's something wrong with production. Right in the middle is the sweet spot for obstruction. And usually what you like is obstruction because you might be able to operate and fix it. So let's talk a little bit about non-obstructive azospermia in more detail. We tend to group these as I indicated. Pretesticular is the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism patients. They'll have low gonadotropins, low FSH and LH. <clears throat> if the testosterone is low, you should be start to think about particular syndromes, the ones you tend to get tested on in medical school and residency, Kalman syndrome, 
acquired pituitary disease, whether it's due to surgery or radiation, prolactinoma, for example. On the other hand, if you have somebody who's got low gonadotropins, but a high or normal testosterone, and you combine this with their bicep is bigger than your thigh, you're thinking exogenous testosterone. And that's probably one of the most common causes we see, I'm sure Stan sees it all the time, uh, causes now. Because when they take exogenous testosterone, it suppresses the pituitary and shuts down the testicles. Flip side would be if you have an intratesticular problem, meaning the testicles themselves, there's something wrong with them, you have a testicular failure, whether it's on both testosterone and sperm production or just sperm production, we call that hypergonadotropic hypogon uh, hypogonadism. The gonadotropins will be elevated. And the testosterone may be normal because that tends to persist uh, farther on with testicular damage, or in some cases it's going to be low as well. Now, genetic testing has become an integral component um, of the male evaluation. Uh, when I first trained, we didn't do genetic tests because you couldn't do anything about these azospermic patients, but now we can, so it's become very important. And when I'm referring to a shotgun approach, it often applies to this as well. We sort of break this down into two categories as well. If you think the patient is obstructed, or do you think the patient is non-obstructed? So for non-obstructed azospermia, so the sperm count is zero, or guidelines being less than five million sperm per cc, the genetic tests that you should consider are the karyotype and the Y-chromosome microdeletion analysis. And we'll go over that in a moment in more detail. On the other hand, if you think the patient is obstructed and you're thinking some sort of congenital absence of the VAS, then you need to do genetic testing for cystic fibrosis. And we'll talk a little bit about what the extended panel is in a 5T analysis. And a really important point is if you find a genetic cause, just because you can do in vitro fertilization and sperm retrieval doesn't mean you should do it. These patients all need genetic counseling because these things can get transmitted to children. So let's talk about the karyotype, the first one that you're all familiar with. The karyotype will determine if there's numeric uh, problems, too many or too few chromosomes. Um, it also will detect large chunks of missing chromosomes, so structural defects such as translocations and ring chromosomes. The most common one, the ones you're often tested on, and certainly the most common that we see, the genetic cause of male infertility is Kleinfelter syndrome. Most of them are pure 47XXY, but there's some mosaics, about 10%. And it constitutes about 5 to 10% of the azospermic patients that we see. These patients usually are going to be azospermic, but the mosaics may have some sperm in the semen, and occasionally you'll see somebody who does. We can do testicular sperm extraction, that's the TESI up there. Uh, in a roughly 50% of these patients, we will find sperm. It seems to be a, probably a little more nowadays. Interestingly, if you do aneuploidy testing or fish on the sperm, there is increased aneuploidy in the sperm, but so far the vast majority of all the children are being born normal. So there's some process that seems, the sperm that end up making babies seem to be okay. And that's despite when they've done pre-implantation embryo biopsy genetic analysis, there is an increase and abnormalities, but still the live births have been normal. Now, why chromosome microdeletion? It's talking about what's called the azospermia factor, which is a, on the long arm of the Y chromosome. There are three areas, starting uh, from the centromere going distally, AZF A, B, and C. Um, these areas contain genes that are important for sperm production. If you have deletions of these genes, it's going to impair sperm production. And these are microscopic, so the karyotype will be normal. If you look on the right-hand side, this is just a frequency distribution graph. AZFC deletion is by far the most common, which is actually fortunate because that's the one we can do something about. And the other, was other deletions, which can be in combination or uh, isolated, are much less common. We find these in about 10% of the azospermic patients and about 5% of the severely oligospermic patients. What's interesting about these, as compared to the karyotype abnormalities, karyotype can often affect phenotype. Y chromosome microdeletion does not affect phenotype beyond the patients that are generally infertile. The vast majority can have very low or azospermic sperm counts. Now, important point about the deletions. If you have uh, complete deletions of anything but C, you probably are not gonna have sperm, 
And we're not gonna find sperm on the testicular sperm extraction or microtessie or any of those techniques. So AZFA, B, or combinations, we're not going to try to extract sperm. On the other hand, as I mentioned, AZFC deletions, or you can have partial deletions of the AZFA and B areas. These patients may very well have sperm and you may find sperm on uh, testicular sperm extraction. We've not been able to predict beyond the genetics I just mentioned, but based on test size, elevated FSH, or even just a random biopsy, who is actually gonna have sperm if you do a micro test or not. So most of these patients, if they don't have the genetic deletions that preclude it, are candidates for sperm extraction. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about why I'm, I'm so pushing genetic uh, counseling. If you take a look at this happy couple here, you have a female XX on the, on the left up top, you have the male with a red Y chromosome on the right. He's got an AZF deletion, AZFC deletion. Let's say that Dr. Honig takes him to the OR. He has 110% sperm retrieval rate in his patients, so he gets sperm. They do IVF ICSI. They have a female child. Well, the child inherited that X chromosome from the father. The X chromosome's fine, so that daughter is gonna be fertile. All the male children are gonna inherit the father's Y chromosome and the exact same Y chromosome microdeletion. The interesting, Part about this is when we look at patients, a variety of patients that have AZFC deletions, they all look the same when we do genetic testing. However, some of them will have severe oligospermia, and they'll have sperm. Some of them will have no sperm, but will have success finding sperm on testicular sperm retrieval. On the other hand, 50% of them will have no sperm when we go in there. And that means we can't predict which of these three scenarios that male child is going to have. And this couple needs to know that before they go down the path to going ahead with ICSI. All right, let's move to congenital absence of the VAS, CBAVD. It's due to one of two things, the most common being cystic fibrosis mutation. So a, a, delete, a, a point mutation in CFTR gene of importance both copies, maternal and paternal copies of the gene have to have a mutation in it uh, for the patient to have CBAVD. If there's only one copy that's mutated, the patient will be a carrier, which is very common in Northern Europeans. The other etiology of CBAVD can be an embryologic defect not related to CF, and those patients will often have unilateral absence of the kidney. While we call it CBABD, as I mentioned earlier, it's associated with absent or hypoplastic seminal vesicles, and therefore you get that azospermia, low volume acidic semen specimens. Now, CF testing is designed for patients who have clinical cystic fibrosis. It's not designed for CBABD patients. There's been over 1,700 mutations so far reported. The typical screens range from 25 mutations, which are the most common in the CF patients, to extended panels of about 100, which is what we will tend to order. Um, you can also now get gene sequencing, which our geneticists will often order. And the more detailed you look, the more likely you're gonna find over two thirds of your patients have, have uh, mutations in both uh, copies of the gene. Now, you may have seen, it also said something about 5T. What is 5T? Well, in the, in, in, in the uh, intron 8 region, there's a series of thymidines, and they can range from five in a row, seven, uh, nine in a row. Interestingly, if you have five in a row, we call it 5T or 5 poly T, that will interfere with the mRNA where it's missing one of the introns, intron 9. So you get an abbreviated mRNA and you get uh, less active uh, CFTR protein. So you think of this as one of the mutations. So if you have a standard, say a Delta F508 mutation on one copy and you have a 5T polymorphism on the other, those are essentially what I sort of consider compound heterozygote mutations. These patients can have CBAVD, even though it's not a point mutation in the coding portion. Now, again, let's go to the importance of CF testing. So CF carrier rate is very common, particularly in the Northern European Caucasian population. So you may have a couple, let's say you have a male with CBABD. They make sperm, we can get sperm out very easily. He's reproducing with a female who's a carrier and you don't test her. Well, if you look at what can happen, half of their children are gonna be carriers. Phenotypically, they'll be fine. On the other hand, depending on which mutations, typically the, 
the CBAVD patients may have a, a severe mutation on one copy and a mild mutation. If it was severe, severe, they'd probably have clinical cystic fibrosis. But depending on which one that the child inherits, they may have CBAVD or, or CBAVD variant. But if they inherit the severe mutation and the mutated chromosome from the mother, they can have clinical cystic fibrosis 25% of the time. So the one, the female partner has to be screened before you do sperm retrieval and then they need genetic counseling. So I think I pointed out that I think proper diagnosis is very, very important in these patients. Just because you can attempt to retrieve sperm doesn't mean it's always indicated. And these genetic mutations often can affect not just the patient, but the offspring as well. So you need to do genetic counseling. And nowadays, we'll sometimes often do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. That's when they do in vitro fertilization, take one of the, the cells from the blastomere and do genetic testing on that and then implant the uh, embryos that are not affected. I want to say a few words about other tests, transrectal ultrasonography. Um, and in deference to the cancer folks here, cancer got nothing to do with this. It's all about fertility. Um, we do it to identify problems of the ejaculatory duct in the seminal vesicles. So who are we going to do it on? We're going to do it on patients who have low volume azospermia and a normal FSH, meaning FSH in the fertile range. Because if the FSH is really high, they don't make sperm. Who cares if they have an obstruction? It doesn't matter. There's no sperm to come out. So point here being, don't get it routinely on all azospermic men, but this is a very common thing I see in patients refer to me that they get all sorts of tests, including a transrectal and a scrotal ultrasound. Most men don't need it. It's very few that we end up doing a truss on. What about a testis biopsy? We're all taught that, and the use of a biopsy has really changed over the last decade or so. Um, there's what we were, were taught when we uh, we're training a diagnostic biopsy. The diagnostic biopsy, the purpose is to figure out, are you making sperm? Are you not making sperm? So the only reason you're gonna do that is when you don't know what it is. And I already told you, if you're smart, you probably already know what it is and therefore you probably don't need a, a diagnostic testicular biopsy on most of your patients. But there will be some where it's just not clear. Then there's what we call a therapeutic biopsy. And that is if you're going to do a biopsy, and the couple may consider doing in vitro fertilization, then you should try to get sperm out of that biopsy and freeze it as well as do your histologic examination. So the biopsy is indicated if the patient has normal sized testes and he does not have an elevated FSH. It's not indicated if they have anything indicating lack of sperm production. So if they have small testes, a high FSH, they have an abnormal karyotype or Y chromosome microdeletion, there's no reason to do a testis biopsy for diagnosis. You know what the diagnosis is. And if you're going to do the biopsy, always consider sperm extraction and sperm freezing at the time. And then they can do ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. What about a vasogram? That's another thing that has largely gone by the wayside for, for many patients. Um, it's been several years since I've done a vasogram. And I used to do many more in the past than I do now. First of all, as I said, if the patient has non-obstructive azospermia, there's no role for a vasogram. There's no sperm to travel the road. It's only indicated if obstruction is present. And since you're going to have to cut into the vas deferens, you should do this at the time that you're going to reconstruct the patient. Otherwise, you risk going in, doing it, and now causing an obstruction because you scarred down where you did it. When you do this, you should always look at the vasal fluid under the microscope in the operating room yourself under 400x white, wet mount microscopy. You want to see, are there sperm there? If there's sperm there, you know the patient makes sperm. Some people used to advocate injecting contrast towards the epididymis to find an epididymal obstruction. The problem is if you do that, you'll cause an epididymal obstruction, so you should not do that. Some people will inject a very small amount of fluid. If so, you open up the vas deferens and no vasal fluid drops out. Some people will irrigate with a small amount just to sample it so they can look under the microscope. That's okay. Just don't inject a lot to do a vasogram or epididymal gram. What do they look like? This is a normal one. And this is something you might see on your, on your boards. You can see the vas deferens coming up. I don't think I have a mouse here. But you can see the vas deferens on the right coming up, it loops around, goes to the midline. You see the seminal vesicle to the right side there. And they join the ejaculatory duct, which is labeled there. 
And then commonly the contrast will go backwards in a retrograde fashion. You'll see the bladder up there. That's what a normal one should look like. This is a fellow I had who had a congenital uh, blockage in the pelvis. He had a right side of hernia repair, which had nothing to do with this. But you don't see any of those more distal structures. And this, while, you've while I've done this, you can't fix it. So he can have sperm retrieval. So a few important points. Most of the time, you can figure out what's going on just based on your history, physical, and your FSH value. You want to do one or both in terms of genetic, uh, one, but not both uh, in terms of the genetic testing. Think obstructive azospermia. You might be doing your CF and 5T analysis, non-obstructive, you carry type of the Y chromosome. Don't do a test as biopsy if you're thinking it's non-obstructed, so meaning they have a high FSH and small testes. And if you're going to uh, go in and do an exploration with a vasogram, plan on fixing it at the same time. So let's get back to our case. I was asked to limit this to about 30 minutes, so I'm trying to do that. Um, and if you have time, I have additional cases we can go over because it's often very confusing. So we have our couple. And this is the same history I showed you before. We gave him our history sheet. There's nothing remarkable in the history. So let's take a vote. Are the testes big or small? Let's say they're small in this particular case, all right? <laughs> this is not a political commentary. I'll stay out of that. Um, on this couple, the vas and the epidermis were present. They appeared normal by palpation. Semen analysis. Residents, what's next? Can't throw a lifeline to Dr. Honan. So let's talk about the volume. The volume is what? Maybe in New Haven. <laughs> Less than 1.5 is low. So let's say it's nor normal volume except here. So you've got normal volume. Of um, primary failure of the testicle, so we want to take a look at his hormones. Um, okay, and uh, can hormones would be the next step. So, just important point. I think we're getting confused on the volume. Yeah. Tells you if it is an obstruction, it's not likely going to be the distal ejaculatory duct Correct. obstruction. Yeah but it doesn't tell you beyond the other differential you mentioned. So the yep. next step by guideline AUA, what does this tell you since you have the microphone? So the, so the FSH is a little bit on the high side, um, uh, over seven, and the testosterone is roughly normal. Um, uh, it's a little, little low, but it's not, it's not uh, significantly low, I don't think. Um, so we have a hyperconatrophic uh, hyper um, uh, patient with normal testosterone. Um, so you have to worry about um, either a primary failure um, at the level of the testicle. Okay, so you're leaning towards non-obstructive uh, uh, non uh, picture. Yeah. So lack of production is what you're thinking based on this, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get, I give you this one. Okay, what else are you going to get? Um, you can get a, uh, um, like a, a micro Y deletion analysis. So okay, now this is going to be harder. Anybody open it up for the residents. What does this tell us? So this tells us that um, there's a, a virtually no chance of finding sperm in a, a, a tessie. So this patient would not be you know, amenable to surgical management of this. So would likely have to go on to adoption if we want to have children. Perfect. And that's exactly what you would do in this kind of case. Good. 
Is that my 30 minutes? No, you, no, you, as, as an outsider, you <laughs> Oh, well, why don't we go through some, I just put on a couple extra cases uh, because I think it helps to work through this despite pelting all of you with all those Raising tests. <laughs> you said that, you'll take the heat. Okay, here's your next case. What's the next step? Um, getting a history of uh, the female of the wife. Okay, so here's some history. And the uh, wife's history is unremarkable. She's seen her gynecologist and there's nothing that comes out of that. Okay. And an examination? And then uh, probably start with a semen analysis. Okay. So looking at the semen analysis, we have a low volume azospermic and also pH is on the more acidic side. And um, given that, I probably would um, start with uh, uh, checking FSH. So if the pH is low, It tells us that uh, the SV fluids are probably not making it into the ejection. So it is obstructive? Or obstructive. Um, the FSH is on the low side, um, and then the testosterone is normal. So in this lab, the uh, normal FSH ranges from 1.4 to 18, according to the, the lab. And I already told you, we're, we don't like to see it above seven or, or seven-ish, but this is in the in our normal range. Just I didn't give you those here, so I'll give you that. Okay. So what are you thinking? If he has low volume and normal FSH, then um, and also pH is more on the acidic side, then I'm leaning more towards obstructive azospermia. Okay, so. There's sort of two things you're thinking about. Is it obstructive or non-obstructive? Okay. You're leaning towards obstructive. And then when you're thinking obstructive, you're thinking, is it distal obstruction, meaning ejaculatory duct semivesicle, or more proximal obstruction? I'm thinking more distal. Because? Because the volume is low and the pH is low. Perfect. So and you... Exam is normal. And the exam was normal. So we did find... Uh, So yeah. um, there's ejaculatory uh, duct obstruction due to midline cyst, and you can actually manage that uh, transurethral to uh, unrethral. Any other options you for this can, couple? Since you're already doing a truss, you can aspirate from the SV and perhaps just like fill the tube there as well. So resection is an option. And early on, everybody and their uncle was doing resections. Is that a fair statement? Um, the problem is there's a fair amount of complications with that. So back then, ICSI wasn't around. There was no ICSI. And this really was all you could do. You could do IUI. You could do intercourse. <clears throat> but nowadays, we can just do sperm retrieval. And the, the complications of TURED would be recurrent epididymitis, ejaculating urine. And many men didn't like either of those kind of problems. So the, the, the TURED, while it's still an option, is certainly not done nearly as often as it used to be. Uh, and it, when you discuss it with a couple, you need to give them both options. In our state, infertility is a mandated coverage, so ICSI is easy for them to do, it's covered. Um, so I haven't had to do a TURED in, in a decade. Yes. Okay, so So, you, you think, no. Why would you want to bother Why would you? Why would you? Why would you not? You generally would. 
the problem is, is the complication rates are, could make the man's life miserable. They get recurrent epididymitis because the, the ejectory duct is like a, uh, the ureter entering the bladder. It's got a non-reflux kind of thing and you resect it, they reflux. And we weren't aware of that back in the early 90s and everybody was doing this and then patients started coming back very unhappy. No, because the, the uh, area where the ducts enter is about at the viru. You don't resect more distal to that and you don't resect the bladder neck, so they shouldn't become incontinent. If they did, that wouldn't be good. Yes, that makes a, a huge difference, the finances, and sometimes the TURED may be covered because it's, it's a urologic procedure, whereas the IVF, which would be $12,000, wouldn't be covered. In my state, it is covered, so I'll often see couples, I say, well, I can do this. No, I just want sperm retrieved and let's just get a baby. And that's less common in non-mandated coverage states. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, let's go to a third and final case. Dr. Honig, you want to pick somebody? Anyone want to volunteer? Oh. Ooh. for a year and a half, wife with no prior pregnancies and the male, same way. Um, so both from that sort of Northern European cohort. So I think you're probably getting towards the CF suggestion, but we'll move on. So uh, physical or the remainder of the history looks like it's negative. Physical exam. Normal androgen, okay. So testes are sort of a little towards the high side, non-palpable vas, and uh, you can feel the caput. So I think you have to be thinking about a CFTR mutation in this case, a CBAVD picture. Um, but I think you're going to get your semen analysis anyway. So low volume azospermia with a little bit of a acidic pH, so you're considering obstruction or congenital absence. So in this case, I think you would, I mean, we talked a little bit about the CFTR screen. I mean, I think that definitely needs to be in the picture here. Anything before that? And would you still get, uh, I mean, I don't think FSH is going to help you much in this case. Usually you would. You get it. Just anyway. be sure, particularly in, 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 in some states, the non-mandated coverage, you can get an FSH. You can't get the genetic testing coverage in some states. Okay. Ours you can. Sure. Uh, so I, pr I would tend to order everything at once where I am, but often you might not. Okay. So your FSH is normal. And testosterone. And then you asked for some genetic testing. Right. So the Delta F508, uh, which is, I think, the most common mutation. So their options are uh, sperm retrieval. It's probably their best option. And of course, we always mention that they could do donor insemination or adoption. But nowadays, most, most would do this. The, the type of retrieval is really up to dealer's preference. Some people do percutaneous, whether it's epididymal puncture, I don't do that, but some people do. Uh, you can do testicular aspiration. For many of these couples, they're young, they're gonna want more than one children, we'll do an open epididymal aspiration, a MESA, M-E-S-A, 
because you'll get millions of sperm and then they can do as many IVFs as they ever want and never have to go back. But any of those are realistic options to do. And what's the life Sure, so they... 12% is now possible. Right. I mean, they need genetic counseling as well to know their risks, you know, the risks for the, the offspring. Absolutely. That's exactly what, if the wife is a carrier, because all, the, all, all the women get tested, if they're a carrier, they do do uh, PGD, and they generally implant the non-mutated one. And that is it for the cases. Yes, sir. What percentage of patients with critical kidneys have both of them general access to the bathroom? You may have alluded to it in your talk, and I, I, I missed it. I've heard of one patient who has not had absence. So it's virtually 100 percent. It's close to 100 percent. And similarly, if you see somebody in the office and you're pretty astute at examining for VESA and you do not uh, find one, what percentage of those patients um, should be screened for cystic fibrosis? In a non-infertility exam, meaning they're not trying to conceive? No, it's well, yes, non-infertility, yes. If you just happen to notice absence of the VAS. Exactly. So it, it, I think they don't have any children. It, it, so it depends on what the goal is, because if, if fertility is an option, then you're going to do what we talked about here, because they, they won't conceive on their own, but they could if you help them. And then you need to know the genetics. If they're not interested in having children or they're past that age, then the only reason to look into it is some of these CBABD patients, it turns out CBABD is at the very white at, right end of the spectrum. And depending on the particular mutations, they actually may have a history of recurrent pneumonia or bronchitis, but they're not clinical CF. So I always ask them, do you have a history of lung problems or in some cases GI problems? Because it really is a spectrum. And if it is, I'll test them and then send them to, to one of the CF docs if it's for their medical management. Thank you. So um, about the ACI method that we said, what are the causes uh, or risk factors that we know? So it, it is a um, spontaneous uh, genetic um, deletion. That is to say, it's, it's not going to be something that the father has because he wouldn't have reproduced unless, of course, we've done ICSI. Um, the particular layout of the Y chromosome allows this folding over of the long arm um, because the, the way that the AZF region is structured um, they sort of line up, and then that section of the loop gets deleted. So David Page has done a lot of work as to why that area sort of hyperdeletion, and it has to do with that particular structure of the Y chromosome. But I don't know that there's any risk factors that increase any one particular individual's. I've never heard of that. Not that I'm aware of. They've just never been able to diagnose it before. No. That they don't know yet, because it looks like these have the same deletions, but some present with one and some present with, you know, some have some sperm, some have no sperm. That they don't know yet. The deletion is transferred and it's, it, they think it's the same. Now, the, the scenario I showed you is hypothetical because there hasn't been studies of children yet since it's not been around that long. There should be, we're probably getting close to the point where some of these children from ICSI will start to be of fertile age, but I haven't seen any studies of fertility in the children. It's too young. We, we don't know whether it's epigenetic. There's something that clearly changes it, just like other mutations in phenotypes don't match. Great. Thank you very much.